everyone. I'm Nate Angel, and welcome to MyFest 22. This is actually the final session, at least the final scheduled session, for the um, MyFest 22 Open Learning Journey track, which is a track that we've been doing now for three weeks that is um, kind of tried to look at open learning and open education from all sorts of different angles. And I'm really excited today because we have a session that's really focused on how to maybe take some practical steps to build open learning in your own practice and your own program and your own institution. We've got some really great guests here to, to kind of lead us through that. So um, before we kick it off, I'd also like to, um, a lot of you I know have participated in multiple open learning journey track sessions or, or multiple MyFest 22 sessions. And I'm gonna share a link uh, in the uh, chat uh, for a very quick reflection document that we would love for you folks to fill out. If you get a chance, if you haven't already, you can do it for every episode. You can only do it once um, of MyFest, um, but it's really helpful to us because this is a completely new event. We're trying to figure out, should more of this happen? I mean, more of it is happening. Frankly, MyFest goes on for the rest of the summer. There's much more going on, even though the open learning track, at least the synchronous part is coming to an end right now. So, um, Without, with all that sort of preamble um, out of the way, uh, I'd like to welcome uh, Abby Elder to the stage to kind of take over things and kick off uh, the program with her uh, co-leaders. Thank you. And I'll just say uh, we have five speakers here today, uh, me, Aperva, Marco, Stephanie, and Jeff. And we'll be introducing ourselves as we get into each of our mini sections, but we're broken up into sort of three teams today to cover individual things related to growing support for open education in your context. So First of all, thank you for joining us today uh, on this for this workshop. Uh, before I move on to introduce sort of the structure of the workshop, I'd like to give a little bit of background on the work underpinning our presentation today, which is on the next slide. Uh, earlier this year, uh, we published the OER Starter Kit for Program Managers, which is a guidebook for new and developing managers of OER programs. The book has 22 chapters, eight case studies from practitioners in the field, and is broken up into major sections like training your team and collecting and reporting data. Uh, you can use the book for your own professional development to train others or just for reference. Uh, and if you want to talk about the book on social media, we use the hashtag OER Starter Kit PM to follow that. Uh, but all right, that's sort of a little bit of background. Uh, and I hope that if you guys are interested in checking out the book, you will do so. We do have a link to it at the end of our slides. But let's get into the actual workshop. Uh, so this workshop has three major parts. The first is building familiarity with your work on campus. The second is project management. And the third is collecting and reporting data. So for the first section, Marco and I will be facilitating. Uh, Marco, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Thanks, Abby. My name is Marco Sarfli Valencia. My pronouns are he, him, and I'm the open education librarian at the University of Idaho. Thanks for being here with us today. And I have not introduced myself yet. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Uh, I am Abby Elder. I'm the open access and scholarly communication librarian at Iowa State University, and my pronouns are she, they. Uh, our first section here today is about building familiarity with your community and learning how you can interact with your local community to support your OER program's growth. Uh, learning more about your institution is a major first step for people building open education programs and especially for those building teams for the first time. As you're starting out, it's also one of the first things you should be doing is sort of getting to know the potential partners you'll be working with and collaborators you can build partnerships with as your program develops. Thank you, everyone, for putting your land acknowledgments in the chat also. It's wonderful to see. Uh, so what we're going to do now is walk through some discussion questions using the Mentimeter information on the screen uh, that you can consider as you're getting your OER program embedded in your community. Uh, if you'd like to log on, all the information is right there. Uh, there's even a QR code, which I've never quite figured out how they work. My phone does not like to recognize them. Uh, but what we'd like is for you to share questions and comments in the chat as we work through these discussion questions. And at the end, we'll be sharing a link to an open worksheet with even more for you to consider as you're jumping into this work. Is there anything you'd like to add to that, Marco? Uh, no, I don't think so. Sounds great. Thank you, Abby. Yeah, so that's the intro. <laughs> so we can get into some slightly more interactive fun bits here. Thank <laughs> you. 
So our first question for you to consider as you're sort of getting into, how do you get started with building familiarity with your community and building familiarity with your OER program is, how do you know that the OER adoption levels at your institution are? How do you know if someone has adopted OER, how do you get that information yourself? And how does that work in your context? Do you even know that process? <clears throat> I love the yet in the comments so far. Never mind. I got to say, it's super affirming to see this. I see a lot of us are in this, I don't know, or I'm not sure, or it's unclear. And I think that's, of course, one of the major challenges with OER adoption levels is you just, you don't know what you don't know, and you don't know if there's a system that you know for categorizing things that you don't know about. So it um, seems like a lot of us are in this place of not knowing. There is this really great answer of the survey of stakeholders, tracking bookstore adoption records, reviewing institutional syllabi, new ZTC course code. Um, I'm not sure if the person who contributed that can share a little bit about how your institution developed that much infrastructure or if that came on as something that was ready for you when you were already there. But is that Veronica who's, yeah, uh, maybe who volunteered that? If they, if they, if you wouldn't mind, I would love to hear uh, any further things you can share on that with us. We developed it piece by piece and um, let's just say tenaciously, uh, but really out of a deep, deep love of of data, uh, you know, I'm an organizational psychologist, so you know, data right there in my heart. So, in order to know, we we needed to get these uh, metrics. Awesome, awesome. That is very helpful. And do you know how long it took over in sort of a time period to create that much infrastructure? Um, we started in. 2015, 2016, uh, and we had begun our first stakeholder survey in 2017. We were fortunate enough to receive a, a large grant that uh, the money was very helpful, but unfortunately was not, it, it didn't do as much as it could have because of the pandemic and because of staffing issues. <laughs> the survey was done off the side of desk. The adoption records were done <clears throat> tenacity and not taking no for an answer and it's all again manually tracked off the side of someone's desk uh syllabi those are part of the accreditation process which we kind of wheedled our way into getting access to and you know fingers crossed that we have a partnership so that uh much better and more competent data scientists can kind of scrape those records based off some work that's done at rice university uh with um Deb Sheila uh, Malik, and, and I'd have to make sure that that name is correct because I know her first name and I always forget her last name. And the ZTC course code was, um, we've advocated for many, many years aggressively with data and wonder, the wonderfully openly licensed book about course marking and, and what benefits it has. And then finally, it was just a, um, frankly, a pronouncement finally that happened uh, with our with our provost, which we're very grateful for. So now faculty self-report uh, whether their course is a zero textbook cost course uh, at the point of putting together their course schedule each semester. Awesome, awesome. Thank you for uh, outlining that for us. And I hope that you'll keep responding to some of the questions coming up because I think there's uh, parts of it that help outline it. And for those of us who had the sort of, I don't know, or we don't have a formal way of measuring it response, um, I think some of the next questions will still be relevant to how you kind of engage even when that's the case. So Abby, I'm not sure if you have any other uh, discussion points you wanna bring out here, if we should go to the next question. I will just note that uh, 
Veronica, they are amazing. Uh, this is so cool. Uh, but I did want to note that you mentioned ZTC courses, uh, and those who do, might not know what that means, a zero textbook cost or a, a marking process for sharing if a course has no cost related to the cost of textbooks. So a way of sort of making that clear for people who are signing up for courses. All right, next question. Where would someone expect to get help at your institution, regardless of whether they actually can? So if someone's looking for help with OER things, where might they go for that help? <clears throat> sort of a loaded question, but th think through it a little bit. If you had no idea where things were, where might you start? And I would say if you're, if you're new to OER, then um, where would you expect to first look for help? I particularly love the person that said library copyright office because it's like, oh yeah, there's something with copyright related to this. Where do I go for something that's got copyright related to it? I guess I'll talk to the copyright office, regardless of if they know anything about this particular issue or topic. All right, and a lot of librarians in the comments of this one as well. I think what's really interesting uh, <laughs> Uh, for people coming into this for the first time is that depending on the institutional or, or the context, your OER program at your own place or any sort of support that's available might be in a library, but it also might not be embedded in that work at all. Sometimes there are departments that lead this work or there are specific, uh, like one person said, center for teaching where most of the people doing like instructional design work are the ones supporting OER and librarians might be sort of farther back and just getting into it for the first time. So starting at uh, a library can often be a good way to like figure out where to go because at the very least librarians are going to know, oh, I heard someone over there is doing it, uh, but they may not be the end point. That one person who is always talking about it is also a wonderful comment. Thank you. <laughs> I was going to say, I was going to highlight the same comment, Abby, that uh, really highlights the sort of a snowball survey uh, style of a lot of the work we're still doing around OER. So uh, really interesting to see how many uh, folks identified librarians. I'm curious if, if folks can contribute. Is that partly that your library has sort of put itself out there as an OER leader, an OER program, uh, somewhere that you can get support? Or is it that you sort of intuit that that's something your library should do? Excellent. So Amy says in the chat that she works with a lot of librarians in different contexts and they frequently mention it. So that's really, uh, really interesting and helpful information, Amy, actually from sort of a library insider perspective where it's like it's partly on our subject librarians to get the open knowledge in their brains and be able to advocate around it on for it on campus because that is a, a direct point where people are hearing about it. Um, seeing the work around open tends to be heralded and hosted in libraries. That's good common true just about the only jobs in open edit higher ed institutions that i know of are in the library wow okay so folks are really seeing that the library is kind of overwhelming the place that is taken up open where you see people with that in their job title and also people who don't have it in their job title are still uh interested and aware of the topic to sort of uh, provide a reference or referral there and then jeff says for his system it's off in the libraries but the uga center for teaching and learning and the University of North Georgia Press also raises awareness quite a bit. So Jeff, it sounds like you've got some pretty powerful players there who are also um, openly and directly aligned with OER on your campus. So that's, that's sort of a, a resource rich scenario, I might say. It sounds like other folks, it's more like the library and that's kind of it. Yeah, instructional designers um, can sometimes be the first and big advocates for OER, but it's going to depend on where you are and how constrained for time those instructional designers are. I think especially COVID and beyond, uh, that shifted a bit. Yeah, that, that's a, a really great point and a, a good acknowledgement of that massive change that instructional designers had to support everyone in going online or hybrid. Um, and Aprova says uh, I'd also go to student advising centers, which I think is a great um, student facing kind of approach that we don't see necessarily in these other spots. And she says that that was especially if she was a student looking for a low textbook 
cost course option. So that's really a, a great remark approval because it helps us to think about this from the student perspective, which is if you needed to identify lower zero cost classes, how would you how would you do that, especially at institutions that don't have text marking yet, um, as my institution doesn't right now, for instance. Yeah, and I think that leads quite nicely into our next question, which is who isn't included in your institution's OER program, but should be? I'm seeing some students, graduate students, teaching professional development staff. And that's an interesting thing too, because if we're looking at, oh, at my own institution, in my own context, I would like to get in touch with this group of people. You might not even have that group in your own context. So uh, two years ago, for the first time ever at my university, we developed a digital accessibility department of one person. And if you'd asked another institution a few years before, oh, uh, who handles and supports accessibility, they, they might say, we have a department for that. There is actual staff dedicated to it, and we would not have been able to say the same. So thinking about, do you have someone or a department or an office that supports professional development for faculty? Do you have uh, a group that helps oversee uh, graduate student development or an undergraduate student uh, government? Uh, not everyone has a student government association. It's interesting to see the differences there, but getting in touch with them can be incredibly helpful. Oh, lovely multicultural center. Thank you. Big plus one for that access to slash disability centers and the real uh, potential for collaboration there and then the real disconnect that we often see a lot of times where um, sometimes our disability centers are sort of siloed off and that just continues in OER. So great point there. Uh, does anyone who contributed any uh, any of these responses here want to elaborate a little bit more on uh, what they see in terms of, uh, you know, like, for instance, I'm curious for the person who submitted a multicultural center. Um, do you have ideas for the OER collaboration there that you want to share with the group? No worries. If not, I just think it'd be really uh, great to hear what what kind of jogged your brain in this direction. So we I wasn't entirely sure what the question was uh, because of the clausy nature of it, like who isn't included but should be, uh, because we couldn't first reflect on who is included. So um, I was going from the perspective of who would you like to be more included but isn't yet? And uh, some of the places where we've tried to do the most work is directly in a student facing capacity, both like information raising, like awareness raising, things of that sort. But it, it very much feels like every time we build a kind of formative relationship with a person in uh, leadership in, in a unit, then they, they move units or they'll leave the university or so it's this kind of revolving door and any investment that we make in that area gets lost with the multicultural center and especially the native student center. They uh, tend to be hubs for the students who are the most historically marginalized or underrepresented in higher education. And so, you know, in at least my opinion, the students who would benefit the most directly from uh, mentoring about the process of finding courses that use the resources that might benefit them, contributing in a really meaningful way to the generation of new open content, if that's something of interest to them. And so it can be these really wonderful kinds of um, places to, to build up support for recognition of and a way of disseminating news about open or other ZTC course resources. And because of that darn pandemic and because of these leadership changes, we've really lost a lot of the footholds there in the places where we wanted to make the most impact. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for sharing that, Veronica. I think that is super helpful to hear you sort of articulate that all out. And I, um, I absolutely agree. I, I appreciate your remarks about our question. I feel like the sort of answer with here might be like institutional durability in the sense that that's not what's included in your institution's OER program, right? It's extremely vulnerable to personnel and individual changes, which I do think is a lot of the context that many of us are still operating on. Our OER programs aren't that formal. And 
uh, you know, are sort of built out of people's interest and passion. And so then when someone moves, they don't necessarily have OER formally defined in that job role is like, okay, so for the next person who's going to come in and be director of the Native Student Center, are they going to embrace um, these really interesting sort of social justice potentials of OER that you're talking about? And it, right, and it's not just the, the economic social justice, but also the representative social justice. Maybe we can actually make these materials better, uh, more representative for our students, really improve our content that way. So. Um, great, great remarks, great comments. Um, I think you did a great job uh, answering our sort of double negative question there. So thank you for those. Um. All right. So what is the recent history of OER efforts within your state or region? For those of you who are in, for example, Ireland or Italy, this might also be your country. And for those again with questions about what this question means, it might mean, uh, is there a few peers and exemplars that have done exciting things in your area? Are there, has there, been, has there been policies passed or grants received at a high level that could impact your work? Is there something that's been happening recently that could sort of drive your movement forward? And we get an excellent example right there, right off the top. <laughs> Uh, State Board of Education is interested in press books and zero cost course markings. Always jealous of British Columbia, you guys. Oh, man. Great work. <laughs> uh, Ecampus Ontario, just <laughs> constantly fighting the tide in the best ways. I will say that much. And for those who don't know, that's okay as well. I know in Massachusetts, they're looking at, uh, oh, is it, what is it, Nebby uh, right now? The yeah. Yeah, they're looking at some work on the regional level to support uh, OER that you might be interested in, uh, in EBHE, uh, the local compact of regional higher ed. And I think I might also just say for the folks who don't know or still are very much in a, a region that's really building in this area and doesn't have anything, um, I, I think the, the, the perception be to can feel you're sort of impoverished or you're not being supported at a, a state or a regional level with some coordinated effort. The kind of flip side of that is you have a little bit more freedom in establishing your programs. It's been really interesting um, in my institution. I'm also someone in a context with a, a state board that has an interest in open. And it's been interesting the way that that's um, sort of backfired in some respects. You know, sometimes faculty have perceived that as a mandate from the state board or something else. And so if you're in a context where you don't necessarily have some big formal structure in your state or region doing OER, it's not necessarily a bad thing. It can be an opportunity to establish your program and your institution in a way that makes sense for you. And then when your state does get on board with this at a wider level, you can say, yeah, this is, we've already got our program set up that work well for us, as opposed to having kind of a top-down directive that then you have to implement. Um, I think it's someone in the chat, Veronica, says Hawaii has been an, an excellent example of the backfire against ZTC and OER that come from top-down mandates. Uh, and that's why we've avoided it so far in Alaska. Thank you, Veronica. Great comments. And uh, we see similar things in Idaho where the kind of state activity around OER can be inspiring, but it can also turn people off or uh, raise questions about intellectual freedom and so on and so forth. So great, great points in the chat and don't despair if you don't have uh, a connection yet. I also think that there's different ways to find out what's happening in uh, the region. So for the person who, for instance, mentioned that you're in Massachusetts, feel free to follow up with us as a team. I'm sure we can get you connected to some different outlets there. Absolutely. I'll say one final thing. Um, one interesting thing about thinking about regional efforts is sometimes it's supported by policy or a, a mandate or a top level thing coming down and other times it's very grassroots. Uh, here in Iowa, our major action team for OER is a volunteer cohort where we're providing support services and reaching out to people and doing presentations and trying to build awareness and it's it's very much largely when we have time, what we're able to do. So even if you are scared that you don't have support or you're not sure what could come out of it, you could still start something uh, to bring people together and build things up if that's something you're interested in doing. And if you have the bandwidth for it, I will say, <laughs> do not push yourself to do more than you are able to. And that's often where these things get stuck. So, yeah. That, that's a great point, Abby. And I was just gonna say that um, 
if you don't that that idea of if you don't have your own community building your own is a great a great approach and so i know a lot of us are the only person working in open in our specific context and so um, it can help to have a, a regional sort of coalition of casual uh, meetings where you're able to bounce open ideas off of each other and kind of connect that way. All right, so what we're going to need to do now is skip over our last two questions. I apologize, but we are out of time for this first third, uh, and I want to make sure that Aperva and Stephanie have time for their section. Uh, so instead, what I'm going to do is post in the chat the link to the full worksheet of these questions and others that you can use to help assess your program and think through some more fun stuff like this. Uh, and of course, we'd be happy to talk with you after this on Twitter or elsewhere if you'd like to sort of get together and ask more of these questions and talk about your own context. Thanks so much, Abby and Marco, and I'm so sorry you had to cut your questions short, but hopefully folks can access that worksheet and continue the conversation in the chat um, as we uh, keep talking for the next hour, thinking about ways to grow your context and grow your um, support for OER work, wherever you're located. Uh, I am Apurva Ashok. I am the Assistant Director and Director of Open Education at the Rebus Foundation, which is a charity based in Canada, um, working on OER. Uh, as I mentioned in the chat, I'm joining you today from the traditional territories of the Mississaugas of the First Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Hurut Oshuni, and the Wendat peoples. I'm very grateful to be part of this lovely conversation. Uh, and to lead you through this next section on project management with Stephanie, and I'll pass it over to Stephanie. Thanks, Sapura. I'm Stephanie Buck. I'm the Director of Open Educational Resources at Oregon State University. I'm one of those strange people whose job it is to do OER rather than have it added on, like many of you have to, uh, have to do. Um, Apurva and I wanted to talk today about a little bit about project management because that's one of the things that can be very intimidating for somebody who's new to the OER world. Suddenly, maybe you've gotten, gotten some grant funding or something like that, and you're like, oh, now I need to actually manage this project from beginning to end. So we're going to do the same thing that Abby and Marco did, was going to ask you some questions, and then we will kind of give you our responses and hopefully have a good conversation about project management. So our first question is, how confident are you with your project management skills? And you can put your response into Mentimeter. Ooh, very, very confident people, excellent. And I'll know for anyone who may have joined midway through, welcome. I'm gonna drop in a link to our poll again if you need it. Or you can also go to menti.com and use the code 28012927. We wanted to start off with this question really to just get a sense of um, everybody's familiarity as you as we saw with um, Abby and Marco's section. Some of you are coming to OER for the first time. Some of you have been working in this space for a long time now. So it's just good to get a sense of, um, of uh, our familiarity before we dive in. So those of you who say you are very confident or slightly confident, hopefully you can help those who are still building their skills when it comes to project management. And we hope that at the end of this section, uh, you will understand why this is a pretty key part of um, setting up a sustainable initiative. It is. And one of the things that we talk about in the, um, the project manager text that Abby mentioned at the very beginning is that it's really important, even if you're very confident with your project management skills, that you step back and you think about things before diving in headlong into a project management program. So that's kind of where we're coming from in this particular question um, is to find out where you, where you folks are. But we can move on to the next question, I think. So one of the things that's really important is how you track your projects. Projects are complicated, OER projects can be complicated. And so one of the first things that you might want to do when you're starting out is figure out what kind of software or hardware you have to that you will need to complete your project. And do you have training for their use? So feel free to use Mentimeter to let us know if you have access, what you're using, and what kind of training you've received or not received in terms of project management tools. 
And you'll see we don't really define the, the word project here because an OER project or an OER learning material can range from uh, a full open course to a textbook to a small set of supplementary learning materials that um, students might be using. So whatever it is, whether it's something interactive or something longer form, um, have you used software before? Do you have a sense of what type of hardware or software you might need, especially for students who might not have access to all of the devices, the digital devices that they might need to, um, to reach the, um, the OER content being created? And thank you to everybody who has been putting in responses. Um, Post-its do count. <laughs> it's very helpful as a, a, a tool to think through and outline and map out um, the project. Um, Folks are also noting that some departments have um, access to better resources than others. So video development tools or studios it ties back to Abby and Marco highlighting um, how that cross departmental collaboration is is so key to doing this work well. One of the things that we recommend is that you find out what's going on at your institution in terms of tools that are being used because there are so many out there that you can use for helping you manage your projects, keeping the, keeping the projects going. And I think the best advice that um, I can give you is um, pick a tool and stick with it and get to know it really well because it's, it's easy to get overwhelmed by the number of tools that are out there and trying them all out and seeing which one you like best. Try a couple of them, but then choose one and stick with it and get to know it really well is I think the best thing you can do with it comes to tools, but also find out what's being used on your campus because that way you'll have a built in support system. If everybody in your if your campus is using Basecamp or something like that, or if you're in your library and everybody is using Trello, then those might be the tools you want to examine first so that you can um, learn from your colleagues and share with your colleagues and be trained by them as well as going out and getting your own training. Yes, yeah, so Veronica says a big shout out to Discord for being such a wonderful hub. Yes, we use Discord uh, for something else that I, uh, another the board of directors that I'm on. Discord has its, definitely has its moments to be able to bring together teams. Um, I personally use Airtable to track all of my pro projects. I don't know what, can't remember what you use, Apoorva. I know that we've talked about this. I think we use a myriad of tools from, from the, the Google suite to Asana to just our community forum. Um, in some ways, um, we also just coordinate with educators at different institutions and see uh, what uh, tools they have access to. Um, as someone notes uh, in Mentimeter, you know, you might have a very minimal subscription um, to a set of tools, but you might have a lot of resources in terms of personnel to help you leverage those features and functionality as you're creating OER. Um, Abby notes that um, she uses uh, Trello. Um, they also note, um, you know, if you don't have to teach yourself a new tool if you can already um, learn from others or if you can learn a tool that others are already using that'll be um, useful for your team. Um, Marco's point about just the cost around tools is definitely one to keep in mind, which is why Stephanie suggested use the resources you have at hand and what's available to you uh, when it comes to OER creation and project management. Yeah, sometimes you can piggyback on what other people already have, um, tools that other people are already using. The free Airtable version, um, I have the license one, so I can't really compare the two that well, but Airtable, I, I like it personally because I can group things and I can sort things. It's like Excel on steroids. Um, so it helps me you know, manage. But again, this is one of those things where I had to pick a tool and, and decide this is what I was gonna use. And there were some other people in my unit who were using it, so I felt like I had some support. I'll also just note before we move on to the next question that piece on training is is um, pretty important as well. Um, that might involve just reaching out to um, those technology offices um, at your department. It could also be a lot of self-training as this person um, mentions in uh, Mentimeter. Uh, you might do a lot of learning how to use the tool uh, on the job as you're creating the project. Um, the first publication might be a little rocky, but the, the ones that follow might get easier over time. So um, 
just keep in mind that you might start working with the tool and, and not fully know how to use it, but OER creation can be a way to experiment uh, with new tools as well. That is true. And speaking of training, another aspect that we think is pretty important when it comes to project management around OER, thinking back to that comment about copyright offices being involved in, in this work, um, how many of you are familiar with Creative Commons licenses? Um, and when you're embarking on an open project, um, do you typically begin with a consideration of, of what that final license is going to be and what license you will apply to the OER material? And this is something that, that even though it feels like it comes at the end of your process, is something that you should decide probably pretty early on in your process just because it's going to make an, an impact in terms of what you're going to be able to use, what kind of third party materials you might be able to in, integrate, what other OERs you might be able to integrate and how you can integrate them uh, into the project itself. You want, somebody says, I won't author until we have that conversation. That is an excellent point. Um, I always, I have it in my MOU. Um, we have that discussion very early on. Um, so that faculty are very aware of what what it means. We, ha uh, we have a comment, we have a couple of staff that are well trained in CC options. We have recommended licenses for our published projects depending on the scope and CSA for student authored projects, for example. Scope is a really important thing to keep in mind. And I do um, like the idea of the NCSA for student authored projects. It's great that you have those. One thing to check is the IP policies at your institution. Absolutely. Um, one of the things that about intellectual property, uh, which is a little bit off of Creative Commons, but, but still related, is that um, when you're creating an OER, you need, to you need to own the intellectual property. You need to own that material. And that depends on your university. Our university has a new rule now that faculty own the course materials that they make so we can more easily convert them to OERs, which is great, but we didn't have that clarified for a long time. So having a clear understanding of that will also be very important. And what we're hoping with these set of questions is to also give you the, the range and breadth of um, of topics that are probably going to come up um, in conversation with, with your teams as you're creating OER, um, as you're trying to grow support for open education at your campus. You might find yourself uh, just looking up when the next Creative Commons um, certificate cohort is running, or you might have a very um, deep and engaged discussion with a CS subject matter expert about um, copyright and ownership of their work. Um, and that pulls in all kinds of um, ethical conversations about how knowledge is, is uh, who knowledge is created by and uh, what knowledge can be disseminated and in what ways. Um, as Veronica says in the chat, shout out to the Creative Commons certificate and thank you for that link. Um, someone else notes, um, although our institution holds copyright to employee work, uh, they say nothing um, uh, that prevents us from publishing our work with a Creative Commons license, which is great. Not all institutions might be as flexible when it comes to publishing um, work openly or really even retaining ownership of the work that you're created under a work for hire um, contract. So it's helpful to keep in mind not only the software and technology pieces, but also the licensing considerations before you start creation. Yeah, um, definitely want to talk to your general counsel probably before you embark on anything, just to make sure that you know that they, how the university is interpreting those intellectual property rules. And Nate notes that all the materials from that program are um, open and available to use. So you don't have to uh, participate in that um, formal training course to be able to access, uh, access the materials behind it. So shout out to the Creative Commons team for making that available. Veronica Enough. has also, um, plugged the Copyright X program through Harvard. Yes, I've heard about that. That's supposed to be excellent. So, so there's a lot of training opportunities for you to get to know how to do uh, Creative Commons licensing, things that you need to consider. So give yourself some time to do that, to step back and say, I'm not ready to go into my first project yet. I need, I need a little bit um, 
of time to learn some of these things because they're important to know early on in your process. Okay, next question. How much do you know about accessibility guidelines, requirements for instructional materials? And how will that affect the usability of your project? Once again, with accessibility and uh, guidelines and those kinds of things, this is something to consider early on in your process. You don't want to try and build accessibility into your project at the end, which is what happens a lot of times. You have to retrofit. That just takes extra time and resources. So thinking about accessibility right up front uh, and working with your authors on accessibility is going to be very important. Um, yes, accessibility, um, indeed. I do my best with all text, headings, the accessible tables, can definitely learn more. Yeah, there's always more we can learn. We're hiring a grad student assistant. Oh, that's awesome that you have a grad student assistant that you can hire to help with that work. Um, there's some very good resources out there about accessibility and OER materials. What I might also say about bringing students on to do this work is part of um, learning about accessibility requirements involves just a conversation with the students in the classroom and understanding what their um, individual needs might be and helping um, adapt the OER to make sure that it is it works for, for that set of students, which can vary semester to semester. So it's not just about learning those requirements beforehand, but being mindful to um, follow up on whether um, the, the work that has been uh, put into that final OER is, is meeting the needs. And if not, to as, as we'll see soon, to go back to the workflow and make the necessary changes. Because OER is iterative, it can be changed over time, and it can continue to meet accessibility needs over time. And Jeff has um, a wonderful resource from uh, Tifriti Arena um, that they've dropped into in the chat, um, as has Abby. Um, yeah. There's the Accessibility Toolkit, which is a great resource for people who are new to the guidelines um, or want to learn more about them. That will really help you uh, figure out what you need to do. And keep in mind that you may not hit accessibility 100% of the time right away. Something This is something that you might have to build up to. Um, Kind of there might be some minimal requirements that you have then that you can continue to grow your accessibility aspect of your program. A few comments in the Mentimeter poll around um, how some of your colleagues might not be aware of accessibility and that could be a barrier to development or how it can be challenging um, for accessibility to remain current in the process of uh, the production workflow. Um, I might point folks to the Rebus Guide to Publishing Open Textbooks. Our philosophy of publishing very much involves um, thinking about accessibility at the at the start of, of uh, even just the ideation phase around a project and continuing to have conversations with the team to remind them and or educate them about the importance of not just web accessibility, but also content accessibility throughout this process. So it could be a matter of um, connecting with technology or access or disability um, services units on your campus. Um, it could also be a matter of connecting with the curriculum designers and instructional designers to think about how the content in the OER can be more accessible all the way down to the language to the different learning pathways that you might want to offer your students. And this is really key to make sure that accessibility doesn't end up as, as someone has mentioned in the poll um, as an add on at the end, but really something that is thoughtfully and intentionally planned in advance. So they're looking at uh, universal design for learning UDL to provide some of the framework for accessibility um, where they're working. And there are a lot of great resources out there about UDL and accessibility for OER. Jeff threw one in. Um into the chat, but there are other places where you can find more about universal design for learning. And it's good to be, again, as librarians, we don't have to know everything. We just have to know where to find it. So it's always good to be prepared in those things. Um, and Veronica mentions accessibility is often presented as an extra when it's really more like an ounce of prevention being worth a pound of, of cure. It, absolutely. If you invest just a little bit of time and training, everything will be easier later on. And I, I totally hear that. Um, 
a lot of the books that my unit published uh, initially at the very beginning when we first started OER were not accessible and we've had to go back and retrofit them and it takes a lot of time and a lot of energy. And so now we're very careful to make sure that accessibility is built in right at the beginning with proper headings and alt text and all that kind of good stuff. Even if it's not necessarily always 100% perfect, we're doing the making an effort to make everything as accessible as possible. And building in the reminder that this is part of everyone's role on the team. It's not just one designated person whose job it is to, to make the resource accessible, but um, authors can, can bring in a lot to this work. Editors can bring in a lot to make a resource more accessible. So can folks who are working more on the, the formatting of the content in those software uh, platforms that you might have chosen. Um, I think that might be a good say, segue for us to also talk about how to sustain this work um, going forward. Um, so we, we're curious if any of you have plans, longer term plans for sustaining and updating your um, OER and work after it is completed. When we think about project management, we're, we're mindful to not just think of sort of the release the OER out in the world and it's done, but you know, Abby and Marco's question talked about uh, collecting data around OER adoption, for instance. Uh, you might have uh, plans to um, update the OER based on student feedback. So we're just curious to hear if anyone has something put in place that we can maybe adopt and use and learn from. Okay, so somebody has our press does annual link checks and is working on a CFP for OER updates, second editions. Oh, that's very good. How many of you have funding to help faculty who want to do updating or uh, want to maintain their OERs, your grant funding, just a one-time kind of thing. That funding, I think, is hard to come by. Um, and someone has and noticed it is a real struggle for, for folks, maybe due to, again, not having the, the financial resources to support this kind of work. I love that folks have um, thought about putting in feedback forms. It's just a simple starting point to, to gather input on um, whether the resource might be meeting the needs that it was initially set out to, to fulfill. I think a good approach to um, updating your work is one, to, to, to look at that feedback and try to prioritize um, the suggestions that are coming in based on maybe um, what your students are saying their needs are, um, trying to build that into the institutional workflow as well. Um, the cycle of annual link checks could be really great. Um, could you also maybe build in um, a specific period of time in the calendar year, in the academic year, where you're connecting with those um, subject matter experts to make minor or perhaps major revisions to the text? Um, are some instructors um, already in the software tools and can they make um, revisions to the work uh, on an ongoing basis and are they recording those changes in a version history, for instance? And the big question is also, does that just need to be on you or are there ways that you can connect with a broader community of practice, connect with the group of adopters who might be using this particular resource around the world um, uh, or maybe just peers at your institution in your department within your state province or local region um, and have more of a team-based approach to updating. And I definitely recommend that this process of sustaining and updating is something that you think about in your MOU or your memorandum of understanding or whatever it is that you have with your authors to say, hey, if you guys aren't going to update this, then we as the publisher have the right to do so, so that you can make sure you can go in and update links and make notes if, if the work is no longer being updated. Uh, we have sort of a, a retention policy on that. How well does it work to build plans, conditions for sustainability into a pilot? I'm not sure I get the question. Uh, do you know, do you get this question? Well, I'll tie it back to the other comment here, which is okay. sustaining something you have built requires sharing. Um, and this might be an open call for, for everyone um, at this workshop today to talk about how your programs might be structured. Um, if you have had the opportunity and, um, and the privilege to um, 
actually update NOYAR and have had um, the the, the funds to do so. Could you share some of those numbers with, with others here so we can plan that into our budgets going forward? Uh, I think a key piece um, to make the case for, for this uh, into a pilot is to talk about um, how OER creation is not just a one-time thing, but if we really want to weave open education into the fabric of, of the institution, we need to be thinking about how this work can happen year after year. Um, Jeff notes that they have a, he has a sustainability plan required in his current program, um, but he also needs to allow faculty in a project um, that maybe didn't go so well to do something else in the future. So um, once the grant program is over, they're more asking if things are sustaining than exercising conditions of you must do this. And this is a requirement that that must be fulfilled. Thank you, Jeff. And it is tough sometimes to get faculty to think about sustainability when they're really focused on their first big OER project. They're not necessarily going to have a plan in place. And so one of the things as a project manager is that you want to help them develop that plan or help them think about that um, and say why it's important that the work is sustained um, and how often it should be sustained. Those kinds of things should be part of your conversation. And a segue to our final question, um, it's not just the faculty member whose responsibility it is to, to sustain that, that OER project. Um, so what additional support might you need um, from library staff or other offices um, on campus to create this type of system or ecosystem or workflow within your institution um, to support OER projects, not just one time, but on a recurring basis? Nate notes that one strategy that um, some have used is to focus on high enrollment classes and have a team approach to sustainability so it doesn't fall only on one teacher. That's a great idea, Nate. And if we maybe want to open up this question more broadly, we can think beyond the campus. Is there additional support perhaps from um, your um, government or um, um, state education uh, offices or units that, that might help with this work as well? An idea is to collaborate with um, folks at various repositories. I think that's great to be able to also track multiple versions of an OER. Nate notes uh, that he knows one school that actually had local businesses and donors contribute to supporting specific OER. That's excellent. I've heard of projects that have worked with local industry experts and bringing them into the OER creation process, as well as with the um, subsequent support to, to help students who might be graduating from certain degree programs uh, as a pathway into the workforce. Um, Someone else notes that they know some colleges where a single librarian is doing all the work, but bringing in other stakeholders and asking for help from administrators, teaching or faculty support offices and others um, is also necessary uh, to not burn out one staff member. I think that piece about burnout is, is so, so critical um, because the danger of, of letting this work fall on just one faculty member to sustain is that that person can get overwhelmed so quickly or even just a small team of four or five people. So as we're thinking about um, growing support for open education, um, let's try to also think about building in thoughtful systems. And I might just turn it over to Stephanie to close us out um, if we need to, um, if there's no more comments coming in before we pass it to Jeff. Yeah, thank you, Aparva. Um, just wanted to say that it, it really helps to sit down and think about these things ahead of time. Um, it's not something that you want to think about after the fact, um, but make sure that you're thinking about these things early on in your process and making them part of your workflow. And Apoorva, do you want to um, wrap yeah. up with some resources? Yes, so um, all of these questions uh, that we've shared today have come from uh, a OER uh, grant project roadmap that I'm just going to, to drop into the chat here. Um, Abby has dropped in a link to our chapter on project management in the OER starting it earlier, but if anybody needs a refresher, I'm dropping it in again. Um, and I think this final comment is a good segue over to you, Jeff, uh, where folks don't always expect that a university will work to support OER, but they've instead turned to the field um, to maybe opportunities like this at MyFest to foster community and to think through these types of plans. So thank you, Nate and others for getting this, this group together. Yes, thank you.
And Jeff, over to you to talk to us about um, collecting, analyzing, and reporting data. Okay, so this one is going to be a little bit different. The first thing that I want to do is just kind of go over some things in the text that I think can help out with the data stuff that we've been talking about already. Chapter 21 is all about getting the data. And you might think, well, okay, we just need to collect it and put it in a particular place, and that's all we need to think about. But there's way more to it. Uh, some of this will come across as common sense to you until, uh, until suddenly the task is there. The big things that you want to keep in mind when you even think of starting to collect data um, are privacy, consent, anonymity, and equity. Uh, I'm not going to go too far into this today. I want to make sure that we have enough time at the end for questions. But it will go beyond what you're thinking of when you're complying with uh, a national act like FERPA. Um, anything that you're going to collect could, in some way, be taken at some point. You have to know where this is going to be housed for sure. But even before then, you want to take a look at anything that you're going to ask somebody if they're applying for a grant, if they're filling out a survey, and make sure that you actually need it in order to answer any questions. Consent, of course, uh, has to do with the stuff that's collected passively for the most part. I mean, there is also the consent part that's more, uh, more obvious, where you're telling people, okay, so this is how your data will be used. But a lot of these survey platforms, uh, if you go into the back ends, they'll ask you all about whether or not you want to collect a whole bunch of stuff that they just collect when uh, by default. Like, where is your IP address? Where is that pseudo location of that IP address? Uh, that kind of stuff, if you don't need to collect it, you're better off not doing so. Um, so it, it goes kind of beyond the stuff that people see and willingly answer. It's more about the stuff that's being collected on the back end. Um, anonymity. So de-identification is super important for things like FERPA guidelines. Um, if you're doing this kind of thing, it can be easier than you think. Uh, if, if you only have one column that has this personally identifiable thing, uh, you can replace it with an anonymized number of some sort. And so long as the version history isn't just, you know, you can't just roll it back and see all the student names or something like that, you should be okay um, in order to track things a little bit deeper without having to worry about um, revealing someone's personal information. And, uh, you know, if you're collecting this data, uh, when you start thinking about it, think about educational equity too. Um, you may not be able to answer the questions that you want to answer later on about equity if you are not able to collect uh, things about, for example, whether or not uh, the students who are being affected by this program are eligible for a Pell Grant. Um, something like that in the United States, that is a, that is a need-based aid type of thing. Um, that can at least give you uh, a baseline of differing socioeconomic statuses, uh, differences in access that can happen. Um, so this kind of stuff is, I think, really important and kind of glazed over when you're suddenly given a task and you just have to go out and get stuff. Uh, it, it happens to me too, and I have to go back to those things. Um, after that, the whole chapter is just a step-by-step -step, uh, data workflow for how you want to get started. Um, I start out with questions, not even getting to know data. That's, that's second. The first thing that you want to know is what everyone is going to be asking about this program. What, what do you need to answer? What do you need to provide? Uh, so you want to look at what we were talking about in building familiarity on campus too, um, on, in especially the stuff that Marco was talking about in that chapter. Uh, who are your different stakeholders and, and where are they in this? What are their attitudes towards this stuff? Um, are you thinking of administrators, faculty, students, uh, even campus stores, if, if they're gonna be working with you, uh, how do they feel about all this? Um, then, you would like to know, then you wanna make sure that you know all of the data types that are available out there. They have a 
basic rundown of what you would need for OER data in, in this, but there are wonderful resources out there for data in general. Um, then after that, it is assigning those data types to the questions that you have. So you might have like a two column list, something like this, where you've got critical questions. What are the data that are required to answer that question? And so you, this is gonna set you up for collecting things in a very effective way that'll allow you to answer questions a lot better um, later on. And then of course, creating that place for your data collection. And that has to do with security. It has to do with familiarity. It has to do with being able to use that data in an effective way. And so there's just considerations uh, in that part. Then we get into calculating and reporting student savings. There are uh, sets of principles here. Um, I'm not gonna go into these uh, that much here and reporting principles as well. Things that have helped in the past. Uh, and then a little bit about the differences in using direct data from grants as opposed to using other types of data, campus store data for adoptions, registration data. Um, and so then of course, all of the different caveats that you can run into. But the big thing I wanna to do today is right down here in recommended resources. So I'm gonna share three links with all of you. And the first one is the demo file uh, for grants tracking. This is just an Excel sheet that has the formulas that you would need to update this stuff over and over again as semesters progress. It also has a lot of the different kinds of data that you would need to collect in order to answer the questions that we were talking about in the past. And then uh, we are working on this, getting a Power BI file linked in Pressbooks. What I'm going to do is just quickly share with you this uh, Google Drive link in order to get that. Now, Power BI, uh, if you have Office 365, you usually have a version of this. It will depend on your institution, whether or not uh, you have access to something like that. So we're not gonna use Power BI that much in a demonstration today um, because not, not everybody's gonna have it. But if you click on the Google Drive link, it, it'll show you a list of stuff. It looks like a zip folder. Just click the download button on the top right side and you should be able to do it. Uh, let me just show you what that looks like. You just want to be able to hit this download button here. Then there is a worksheet for the Excel file. And this is the cool one that I wanted to do something with today. So please have both the demo Excel file and the worksheet for it uh, downloaded in the same place. So the reason why I'm sharing my screen and not a particular window is because I want to bring both of these up. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to one of the questions on the worksheet. And I'd like for you to take the Excel file and the uh, worksheet question and see if you can answer it. Um, the first one's going to be easy, but I'm going to give a little bit of time because everybody's downloading stuff at the same time too. I've got three different kinds of questions here. One of them is just, if you look at the Excel file and do a little bit of stuff, you can probably find that answer. Um, the next one, is a little bit more advanced in how you would have to look at stuff in, in this Excel sheet. But then the third one is where there is probably insufficient data where you'd probably need qualitative data for a lot of this, or you'd need external stuff that just isn't there. And there's more questions to consider. If you take a look at it and you go, what else would we need? That's the kind of thing that, um, that this should get you ready for. Okay, so the First one that we're gonna do is, uh, we are going to do number three, which is what is the subject area in the Excel sheet with the most grant funding? So not the most grants, the most grant funding, the most uh, uh, money awarded for, those particular, for that particular subject. I'm gonna give you until 12, 16, to do so and just type that right into the chat. Veronica, what did you find? 
mathematical subjects. Uh, yep, so uh, hmm, over 2.2 million in, oh, so that was in savings, um, Veronica. So that was the one that, that saved the most. Uh, the one that was awarded the most, if you look on a, uh, a pivot table here, was biological sciences. Now these aren't going to make that much sense because the uh, the numbers are somewhat randomized. That's just in order to make sure that these aren't pertaining to a particular uh, project or anything like that. Um, but yes, if you look back at, whoops, here. Actually, you know what I can do is I can just take this pivot table and do the uh, total, grand total savings in the values, then you can tell here that yes, it is. Yeah, so I just threw it into a pivot table at that point, um, but there are also other ways that you could do something like this. Like you could you could sort them uh, over here and do it. I, yeah, that's true. It, it is, it's weird to get a pivot table to sort. You have to kind of do it over here and be all, yeah. So I would do ascending by uh, sum of total award to answer the worksheet question. And now all of a sudden we have, whoop, and there's biological sciences at the top there. <laughs> Abby says, yes, pivot tables are a miracle once you learn to navigate their nonsense. That is true. Um, another thing that you could do if you go into Power BI, if you have access to Power BI and this thing feeds right into uh, the Excel, um, what you can see here immediately is the number of student savings. But if you go to awards, here's the total awards uh, by subject area and you can see biological sciences and then psychology, then mathematical subjects. Uh, so uh, what's cool about this data visualization template is that a lot of these questions can be answered for you in a, a kind of automatic way that you may not see in an Excel sheet. Uh, so it's it's kind of cool to, to look at um, not just a data visualizer as a thing to, to, to show it off to people who do not want to look at an Excel sheet, but it can help you too. You can just kind of take a look at that and be like, oh yeah, of course, that's the biggest part of the pie. Let's do something real quick then. This question here, where the data isn't enough. Number three, so you get an email from the provost at your institution. They're super engaged. You're so happy that they reached out and they ask you, uh, our, our institution, and I only randomized numbers up to 20 for the institution, so I put institution 21 because it's not on the sheet. Uh, they said, we haven't received a grant. Why haven't we and how can we change this? What would you need to know that isn't in the Excel sheet uh, in order to do that? Whether anyone from that institution has applied for a grant? <laughs> yes, and, and Veronica said the same thing too, right? You would want to know if there were applications that came in and just didn't hit the mark. If they didn't, why? Uh, it could be that maybe Institution 21 is a very small college that used to be a junior college. They have about 200 students a year, and the impacts just didn't get past the peer reviewers because of that. Um, that's that's absolutely true. Anything else? I mean, Jeff, to me, it's like there's a whole qualitative story here, right? The whole context, like we just we just don't know. And it, I, I think part of what you're hopefully trying to drive us to is that we got to think more than just quant, right? You can't just think of the stats and the figures and the adoptions, but how do we tell our story about our OER adoption and how do we track it, especially across a program and potentially different program managers? How do I take all this institutional knowledge I have and transfer it? Exactly. I mean, Marco's chapter uh, that uh, that I co-authored with him, but I told I talked more about environmental scans in that chapter. Uh, really gets into this stuff. Um, what what's going on on your campus that you can't possibly get from quantitative data? Do you have people who just resist uh, OER? Do you have people who just resist any program from a consortium or a statewide program? Uh, we I was recently talking to uh, a set of champions who told me that their institution is really happy that they protect their faculty from all of the state system initiatives. 
<laughs> like I understand because initiative fatigue is terrifying. And during COVID, you don't want to be bombarded by emails and things like that. But now you're protecting them against us raising awareness for OER. That that also does not work. <laughs> Uh, yeah, Veronica also said, how much outreach, if any, has occurred to that campus? Uh, yeah, and is it is it reaching folks? Maybe you have a listserv that goes to everyone. Uh, we don't. Um, is that going to jump there? Uh, is there an IT policy that isn't accepting your email? Uh, yep. <laughs> yeah, that fosters resistance to all interventions. Right. So if you're in a state system that... Uh, that has a varied group of institutions in it. Uh, sometimes those institutions kind of feel like, we don't really need this other organization. It's nice that they're there, but we help them. We're, we don't need this stuff. You know, like, there are some administrators that might think that. Uh, and at that point, they're going to, yeah, they're gonna wind up not seeing some really cool stuff. But it's also kind of a wake up call to the organization in question that, you know, one thing goes wrong with one initiative and suddenly you could have all the doors shut on you too. So there's a lot of communications and how it's super important that each interaction is good kind of stuff going on there too. And I'll just note, you know, um, I hope that these three pieces of today's workshop have given you a little bit of a preview of, of what you can find um, in the OER starter kit here. Um, if you were curious and if you wanted to connect with, with all of us a bit more, um, you're welcome to um, use the bit.ly that um, we're dropping into the chat that Abby has just dropped into the chat. Uh, and then I might hand it over back to Abby to um, use our final five minutes for any questions and discussion. Absolutely. Thank you, everyone, for showing up. I, I said it on Twitter. I said it here. But I feel like, you know, we could go a whole three hours with this and really delve into it. But I hope that this has given you sort of a taste of not only what's in our book, but also some of the ways that you can get engaged and think about things happening in your OER programming. So while we still have a few minutes, does anyone have anything you'd like to follow up on, ask about, or share? And to everyone else, anyone who might be watching the recording, thank you for doing that. Anyone who had to come in and drop off midway, we appreciate you too. Uh, and Nate, I think you had mentioned at the start that um, this was the final workshop for, for this week. Um, is there, are there any closing comments around MyFest, uh, logistics that folks might need to hear about or programming for next week that you'd want to shout out now? Yeah, um, so first of all, yeah, thank you, Purva. Um Great. This was just such a great introduction to all the considerations one might have to take into account to, to expand a program. And obviously, there's a lot more depth here that everyone could dive into. So yeah, three hour or three day, perhaps workshop, it could be. Um, and I would encourage people, you know, you don't have to bite it all off at once, right? Um, you know, to pick one piece that is gonna gonna help advance things a little bit and start there and you can grow it out from there. So don't don't feel overwhelmed. Um, so when it comes to MyFest, yeah, so this is just the final session of the open learning journey track. So um, MyFest is going on throughout the months of June, July, and August. So there's a lot more happening that just isn't organized around this open learning journey track. Um, so I encourage you to stay engaged with um, all the emails and the websites and so forth uh, that and calendars that you get from the MyFest community. Um, also, if you're participating in the Slack, there's a lot of conversation going on in the MyFest Slack. Uh, which you can get to from the MyFest website if you haven't already. As we move forward, those uh, recordings and so forth will actually be moved out more publicly to YouTube um, as part of the kind of ongoing MyFest collection. And so all this material is going to kind of like exist as like kind of almost a mini curriculum that people can visit. Um, so uh, I really appreciate uh, everybody's participation today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks so much, everyone. Thanks for your time and attention. Thank you for organizing.